All right, you're good. All right, Shane. So back in World War II, there was this event called Battle of the Beams. And basically, it was where the Rolls-Royce factory in Derby, um, as you in a world where space and was producing uh, parts for the war effort. And so in England, after they had retrofitted this factory and turned it into a war production facility, German intelligence became aware of it. And so they decided that they wanted to um, destroy that factory in order to, you know, hurt their production capabilities. So the only problem was, is that England had enacted, you know, sufficient air defense systems to be able to shoot down any planes that they saw flying during the day. And there was no way that they were going to be able to fly all the way from Germany to, to England during the day and drop bombs on this factory. So they decided, well, if we fly at night and we fly, you know, high, like 15, 20,000 feet, we'll be able to, uh, you know, do it without them seeing us. And they also won't be able to get us with radar. So that's what they did. But the only problem was, is flying at night, in order to be stealthy, they'd have to be flying blind, basically. No lights or anything. And also, they wouldn't have any way to reference where they were, because they also would turn the lights off um, at certain places in, in England so that they wouldn't be able to, to track it that way either. And so they needed a navigation system to be able to guide these bomb planes there in order to be able to drop the bombs accurately at night. So the German engineers came up with this idea. They said, hey, why don't we just triangulate the position? What we can do is we can build these radio towers. And what we'll do is we'll send two different beams. And based on, you know, we know where the map says that the location is. You know, they plug in the location, lat long, all that stuff. They point the beams directly towards Derby, towards the factory. And what we'll do is we'll have the planes fly inside one of the beams. They'll have receivers inside of the plane so that they can tell when they're in it. You know, it'll, it'll go off. The receiver will go off and make a noise or whatever as long as they stay within the beam. So if, if at any point, you know, it goes off and, it, you know, the, they stop receiving the signal, they know they've flown out of the beam. So they'll orient themselves in a straight path through the center of the beam, and they'll fly towards Derby. And then the other beam will intersect that beam uh, right when they are over the bombing area, the bombing zone, so that once their receiver receives the second signal and they're receiving both signals simultaneously, they'll know now it's time to drop the bombs. So that's what they did. Now, the only problem with this is that these towers are very, very far away. Um, Cleve is about 331, 333 miles from Derby, and Stolberg Hill in Nordfriesland is about 450 some odd miles away. And so what happened is, is they made a successful bombing run or two. And British intelligence is like freaking out. They're like, how are they doing this? We don't know. They're trying to figure it out. Well, they did their investigation and they figured out from a POW, they had uh, gotten back that had been held captive, that they had word that the Germans had built radio towers, microwave towers, uh, I guess it wouldn't be microwaves, but radio towers to, you know, target them for bombing. But the problem with it was that based on the curvature of the Earth, there's absolutely no way that these radar beams could possibly have reached the city. And so when they were presented with this information, Winston Churchill's, you know, engineers uh, kind of discarded it as dumb. They're like, that would never work because they're too far away. The curvature of the earth would block the beams. So they just didn't look into it at first. You know, when you look into the history of it, the bombs continue dropping. They continue getting hammered. And eventually they're like, okay, we're going to be forced to look into it. So they did. And when they did, they found that these towers were in fact real. Um, there's a whole Wikipedia page on this, on Battle of the Beams. But it raises a strange question because these beams were operating between 30 and 33 megahertz. And measurements taken when they finally found it, because they, after they investigated it and figured out, you know, where these towers were and what frequencies that they were operating at, they were actually able to intercept the signals with their own planes by searching in that frequency band. 
They found that the beams, by the time that they reached Derby, were about 400 to 500 yards wide, uh, which is, you know, still a pretty tight bombing zone uh, to drop when you're hitting a factory. You know, that's why they're able to be so accurate. But this is disturbing because this means that these were, number one, the fact that the planes had to fly in the beams the entire time, right? That's how they maintain their orientation, knowing they're going the right way, shows that it was a line of sight transmission. If you even go to the Wikipedia page, it says that these were more or less line of sight transmissions. So line of sight, that means point to point. That means a straight line. So the planes were flying in a straight line from Stolberg to Derby. And then, or from Cleve to Derby. and then. You also account for the fact that they were operating at, you know, 30 megahertz, 33 megahertz right in that band. That's right at the threshold at which skywave propagation can reliably occur. So even if you said it wasn't line of sight, if you wanted to make that argument, you would have to basically state that they were doing skywaves. Now, if you could go to the next picture, Alan. This shows the distance from Stolberg to Derby. And if you could go to the next one, this shows the distance from Cleve to Derby. So as you can see, 451 and 333 miles. Now, if you use Walter Bislin's Earth Curve Calculator, you can see exactly how much of a drop there would be. Uh, this is the one from Stolberg Hill. So as you can see up there, accounting for standard refraction and everything, I'm not necessarily sure that you would even need that because of you know these RF frequencies, more like a straight line, right? But it just, you know, giving them the most benefit of the doubt possible, you would have about 112,000 feet of drop. And if the plane that you, in question was flying at, you know, at the maximum altitude back then of 25,000 feet, op total operational maximum back then, then there would be 96,000 feet of hidden height. Okay, so by the time these beams. This beam went from Stolberg Hill and reached Derby. It would be 96,000 feet in the air. Okay. This creates multiple problems. Number one, let's presume that you want to appeal to, you know, sky wave bouncing. Under perfect conditions, something right above 30 megahertz can still be sky wave reflected off the ionosphere. So someone might say, oh, that must have been what they were doing. This must have been what was at work in this, in this situation in order for the planes to intercept the beams once they were over Derby. Well, there's a problem with this explanation. See, sky wave propagation, also known as bouncing or skipping, it does not occur in perfect straight lines or at perfect angles. It will always end up reflecting the ionosphere will always end up reflecting the, the wave it receives at some level of cant, some angle of cant. There will be some small angle at the very least. And that angle is going to be ba based on, you know, whatever the atmospheric conditions of that day are and a bunch of other variables. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be a parallel, just perfect straight line reflection. Now, this change in angle, regardless of how large or small, would have caused a shift in the point at which the two beams being used would have intersected, meaning that they wouldn't have intersected at the point they were supposed to intersect, right over the factory. They would have intersected somewhere off to the left or to the, off to the right. An angle change of only one degree from the beam, shot from Stolberg Hill or Cleve, would have shifted the point of intersection of the beams by many kilometers. Another problem with the idea that they were shooting sky waves is the fact that when people actually do shoot sky waves, right, they, they aim the projecting equipment directly towards the sky. Uh, but that's not what they did. They shot the beams directly towards the target because the planes were actively flying inside the beams the entire time that they were flying from Germany to Derby. The only reason the beams could have ever eventually hit the ionosphere in the first place would have been because as you travel a further distance, the beams would have naturally trailed off towards the sky as the earth curved away from the beams underneath. But when you look at these images, you know, the earth curve calculator, you can see that variable right there labeled drop at the top and, you know, the hidden height. You can see the altitude the beams would have been at when they reached Derby. Um, you know, you can see that when we look at these altitudes, 
you got the altitude of the beam being about 96,000 plus feet. Now that is far, far below the ionosphere. That's far short of the ionosphere. Okay, you're not even getting close to the ionosphere to be able to bounce down in the first place. But still far, far, far above the altitude that the planes flew at. Which means that if the plane's at 25,000 feet and the signal's up in the sky at 96,000 feet, you're not receiving that signal. This is why, you know, it's a historically documented and known that these were line of sight transmissions. The planes had to be flying inside the beams the entire time, and then the other beam, when they got there, would have hit them, uh, and they would have gotten a double signal and, and known when to drop. So, in conclusion, by the time that these beams traveled from Germany and reached Derby, on a globe, if, if the Earth was a globe, the beams would have been far too high above the planes for the planes to even be able to receive the signal, but they would have been far too low below the ionosphere in order to experience any sort of a skip or bounce or sky wave propagation, reflection. And even if you just ignore all that and you just use brute force logic and assume that somehow a sky wave bounce did happen, that bounce would have caused an angle change, which would have defeated the whole point of this accuracy of the system because it wouldn't have ended up in the same position. It would have been off by kilometers. It would have defeated the whole point. And we know historically this system factually worked to factually perform precision strikes on the Rolls-Royce factory. Thus, the conclusion is that the Earth cannot possibly be a globe of 3959 miles in radius. Well said. Thank you, sir. No objections. Close the case. We win, I think. <laughs> I think that's how it works. We'll adjourn we'll yeah. adjourn court here in a second. Uh new perspective and Fano Mano. Anything to add before we rule on this? Oh, real quick, I before just got here. Before they interject, he, he said he agrees. I want to mm -hmm. add one thing in. Um if you look at this calculator, you'll see the observer height is six hundred and fifty six feet. That's the height of the tower. Mm -hmm. Now I do have, um, you can, this is public information, you can look up on Google, the altitude of Stolberg Hill in Nordsfriesland, okay? It's about two, uh, it is about 43 meters above sea level, okay? And I just went ahead and added 150 or so meters to that, we went ahead and made it 200 meters, and converted the 200 meters to feet because we said okay you got a 43 meter hill and you get a 150 meter tall tower really tall tower so that's taller than the modern day uh, ray, uh cell phone tower that exists there today um Deutsche telecom runs it and you know it's 139 meters high but we said okay we'll just make it even taller the, t the say the tower they built was even taller historically it's not if you look into it but we'll say everything was 200 meters above sea level so we're you know giving plenty of margin of error that's that 656 feet that you see there. So assuming the tower is 656 feet above sea level, then you end up getting this hidden height of 96,000 feet. But you guys could play with these numbers. I mean, you could make it, if I made the tower 6,000 feet above sea level, you've still got hidden height of 30,000 feet, right? So it still doesn't work for a plane flying at 25,000 feet in the air. There's no way you can possibly make it work on a globe it is impossible all right all. well with that amendment i definitely concur thank you so the ruling is super therefore, flat yeah therefore the judges say super flat indeed so 